Good morning, and welcome to our Alaska Collaborative on Health and the Environment teleconference on perinatal exposures to BPA and other endocrine-disrupting chemicals, state of the science and policy update. My name is Diana DeFazio, and on behalf of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, I'll be facilitating today's call. CHE Alaska is a regional partnership group of the National Collaborative on Health and the Environment. CHE Alaska aims to advance knowledge and effective action to address growing concerns about the links between human health and environmental factors. You can find more information on the following websites, akaction.org and healthandenvironment.org. Our presenters today are Dr. Nicole Acevedo, a postdoctoral researcher at Tufts University School of Medicine, Kathy Curtis, Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York, and Pam Miller, Executive Director of Alaska Community Action on Toxics. Everyone who signed up for the call should have received a link to the presentation. You can also access the presentation by going to our homepage at www.akaction.org. Just click on the title of today's call. The call will last one hour with time at the end for your questions. And we chose today's topic and speakers because for ACAT, understanding the emerging science on the health effects of exposure to toxic chemicals, especially during critical windows of development, is a key to protecting future generations. Um, we also believe in taking a precautionary approach to policy, and so we're really pleased to have both Nicole Acevedo and Kathy Curtis to share their expertise with us, and we'll be hearing from ACAT's Executive Director, Pam Miller, towards the end of the call about what we're doing in Alaska. Since we have three speakers today and we want to be sure we have time for your questions, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Dr. Nicole Acevedo. Dr. Acevedo is a postdoctoral researcher at Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Acevedo investigates how perinatal exposure to human-relevant internal doses of BPA, which is bisphenol A, is associated with the induction of mammary gland lesions and malignant tumors. She holds a doctorate in molecular and integrative physiology from the University of Michigan School of Medicine. Following completion of her doctoral degree, Dr. Acevedo worked as a clinical embryologist at the Reproductive Science Center in Lexington prior to returning to academic research at Tufts University School of Medicine. Dr. Acevedo was selected as a fellow for the Reach the Decision Makers program from the University of California, San Francisco Program on Reproductive Health and the Environment in 2013. She is a current member of the Endocrine Society, the Women's Environmental Reproductive Health Consortium, and the Association for Women in Science. Welcome, Nicole. Would you like to go ahead and begin? Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Diana, and the members of the Che Alaska Network for the opportunity to speak with you all this morning or afternoon if you're on the East Coast as I am. Today, I will be giving an overview on the state of the science regarding the known health effects of perinatal exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals. To begin, next slide, sorry. To begin, I just want to give an overview on the endocrine system itself. So endocrine glands secrete molecules known as hormones that directly enter the bloodstream to produce effects on distant targets cells and tissues. In humans, there are over 50 different hormones and hormone-related molecules that control normal body functions. And basic endocrine mechanisms are highly conserved across all classes of vertebrates. Major hormone organs and systems include the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the stomach, adipose tissue, adrenal, cardiovascular system, thyroid and parathyroid, liver, stomach, mammary gland, the ovary and uterus in the female, the testes and the prostate in the male, and the placenta in the female. Now, although the mammary gland is primarily considered an exocrine gland, which means it produces secretions that are external to the body, it is actually a glandular structure that develops within a fat pad, and that fat pad has been shown to produce the hormone leptin and also local production of estradiol. So that is why I'm including it in this list of endocrine glands. Now, hormone action on target tissues is, is a relatively complicated situation. <laughs> so hormones exert effects via binding to high affinity receptors in target tissues. And in general, in adults, hormones have transient effects on target tissues. And low concentrations of the hormone are sufficient to initiate very large biological effects. Hormones also work under what is considered non-monotonicity, 
What that means is that their dose responses to natural, naturally circulating hormones are nonlinear. And as you can see in the, the graph below, um, there are, these are different examples of what a non-monotonic response can look like. So on the far left, you have a, a sigmoidal response. In the middle graph, you have what's called, in yellow, a, a U, or in blue, an inverted U response. And on the far right, you have a biphasic non-monotonic response. So it's really important to consider this because this becomes quite an important issue when trying to assess the potential adverse effects of synthetic hormones um, in, for risk assessment purposes. Now, the critical windows of human development really do encompass both prenatal and postnatal windows. And as you can see in this figure below, sorry, next slide, I keep forgetting to say that. <laughs> um, as you see in the figure below, that specific organ systems develop in very discrete time points, both pre- and postnatally. Hormone actions during development program postnatal function of target tissues. This is exemplified by what we know about estrogen and androgen during prenatal development and subsequent development of the reproductive axis in adulthood and also by the importance of the thyroid hormone during prenatal development and consequent brain development in the adult. Impairment of proper hormone action during development can lead to irreversible health outcomes later in life. For example, the developing fetus is almost solely dependent on the mother's thyroid hormone. As, as a fetus, it does not make enough hormone of its own until about 20 weeks of gestation. Therefore, fetal brain development can be permanently harmed if the mother has low thyroid hormone levels. Next slide. So, diethylstilbestrol, or DES, is a seminal example of how fetal exposure to a synthetic estrogen can lead to severe adverse health outcomes later in life. The DES was a synthetic estrogen prescribed worldwide between 1940 and 1971. And it was prescribed for the supposed prevention of abortion, miscarriage, and premature labor. Unfortunately, young women that were exposed in utero to DES had been diagnosed with reproductive tract malformations, infertility, and rare vaginal cancers. And more recently, studies in those first generations of, of primarily women that were exposed um, at the age now where they're more likely to develop breast cancer, which is at about 40 years of age or greater, these women tend to experience a 2.5-fold greater risk of developing cancer compared to age-matched women that were not exposed fetally to DES. Next slide. So in 1991, Dr. Theo Colburn, a zoologist that was researching the effects of maternal transfer of persistent man-made chemicals in predator species of the Great Lakes region, convened 21 international scientists from 15 different disciplines for what became known as the Wing Spread Conference. And at this conference, the participants convened to review evidence for endocrine disruption in developing organisms via exposure to synthetic chemicals that were introduced in the environment by human activity since the mid-1950s. They hypothesized that fetal exposure to hormonally active chemicals may be contributing to in the increasing epidemiological trends in altered metabolism, reproduction, behavior, immune and cardiopulmonary and brain function, as well as in rates of cancer. It was at this time at this conference that the term endocrine disruptor was coined. In 1996, Dr. Colburn co-wrote the book called Our Stolen Future, shown here on the right. This book was an extensive review of over 4,000 scientific publications, and they examined the chain of evidence that man-made chemicals interfere with the normal function of endogenous hormones and can result in altered development and disease states. The research included data from wildlife populations, human epidemiological studies, and experiments on laboratory animals. Following the evidence that had been generated to date, 
1996, there was an executive order for the, U for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency to develop the Endocrine Disruptor Screening Program, or EDSP. And it was tasked to test chemical substances for their ability to produce effects similar to those produced by estrogen, androgen, and thyroid systems. And as perhaps um, Kathy Curtis will allude to in her talk, um, the evaluation of chemicals at this time has been a rather uh, protracted process. Um, just to give an example, that the, uh, e the EDSP program was tasked in 1996, and in 2014, they are just finishing the weight of evidence evaluations on the first 52 chemicals. So, next slide. Endocrine disruptors, what are they? How are they defined? Well, following the publication of Our Soul and Future, and as I said, more international and national um, information being generated on, on the topic, Japan was actually one of the first nations to get on board with addressing the issue of endocrine disruptors on a national level. And then subsequently, the United Nations and Canada followed suit. And in 2002, the World Health Organization, in conjunction with the International Program on Chemical Safety, defined an endocrine disruptor as an exogenous substance or mixture that alters the function of the endocrine system and consequently causes adverse health effects in an intact organism or its progeny or subpopulations. And they deemed a very real need for broad, collaborative, and international research initiatives to provide evidence for adverse human health effects following exposures to chemicals that can affect the endocrine system. Now, 10 years later, in 2012, the, the WHO, along with the United Nations Environment Program, published an update on the state of the science. And that, can, that reference can be seen in the picture uh, to the far right. Next slide. So in the state of the science um, update that was generated in 2012, there is a lot of information related to both what is what are now deemed known endocrine disruptors as well as what are potential endocrine disruptors. And, I want to just summarize um, the known endocrine disruptors in, in terms of broad categories. So, next slide. So, these categories include pharmaceutical estrogens, such as DES, phytoestrogens, which are plant derived estrogens, such as genistein, which is found in soy, persistent organic pollutants, which are the byproduct of many industrial processes, including burning chlorine bleaching, and also the manufacture of pesticides and herbicides. Now, this is a particularly insidious group of chemicals because they are persistent, which means that they do not biodegrade easily, if at all, in the environment. And they tend to bioaccumulate. So dioxins uh, is a major category in this group, and they were actually declared a known human carcinogen in 1997. Polychlorinated biphenyls, or PCBs, um, they share a structural similarity and mode of action to dioxin, and they were phased out, actually, and banned in production in the U.S. was banned in 1977. Um, unfortunately, the they, they levels of PCBs persist at, a, at quite a high level globally to this day. Pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. Organotins which are known stabilizers in poly, polyvinyl chloride products. And another example of an organotin is actually tributyl tin, or TBT, which is an industrial biocide. So by that, it's used as an antifungal agent in paper and textiles, and also used on the bottoms of ships to prevent organisms from adhering to them. So it's called an anti-fouling agent. Also, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, which are flame retardant chemicals that are used in many, many consumer products to this day. Perchlorate, uh, an additive for many industrial products. Perfluorinated chemicals, 
or PFCs, which are found in nonstick cookware. And some of these are actually completely resistant to biodegradation under environmental conditions. So another category are the plasticizers. Um, so polyvinyl chloride, uh, polyvinyl chloride sorry, and polycarbonate plastics that are used for many consumer and medical device products. And the most um, ubiquitous and studied, well studied chemicals are the phthalates and the phenol A or BPA. And then we also have heavy metals that are known to be endocrine disruptors, such as lead, cadmium, mercury, and arsenic. Next slide. So when trying to assess the ability of an endocrine disruptor to disrupt an organ system, you have to think about the different areas that it can, that it can actually disrupt. And it can disrupt at the synthesis level of the hormones. It can also affect the receptor function. So um, this is an important concept to, to take note of, um, a concept of affinity versus potency of a hormone. So affinity means the ability of a, of a molecule to bind to a receptor, and potency relates to how much of a chemical is required to give a certain response. So for example, BPA has long been considered a weak estrogen, and therefore quote unquote safe, because it has a low binding affinity to nuclear estrogen receptors. But there is mounting evidence that BPA can actually elicit really potent cellular responses at very, very low concentrations via non-classical estrogen-mediated pathways. So you also have the consideration of interference with developmental programming of tissues and organs. And as, we have, as I mentioned previously, prenatal exposure may alter the response of a tissue to hormone exposures later in life. Um, also, epigenetic processes might be affected, and what this relates to is changes in the effect or the function of a gene that has, that, that's different from the DNA sequence. So they can, they can um, affect patterns of function without causing a specific gene mutation. And these, there, there are many instances in which these epigenetic processes have been shown to be affected across generations. What that means is if your grandmother is affected, you might actually be um, also privy to the same epigenetic defects that occurred during her exposure. And also we deal with, there are many mixtures of both endocrine disruptors and endogenous hormones with other endocrine disruptors. So there's just a slurry of of different um, chemicals, endogenous and exogenous, that we can that we have to be dealing with on a daily basis. So next slide. So the greatest challenge in trying to assess the adverse health effects of synthetic chemicals on humans is the inability to, to determine our exposure to, to specific chemicals or chemical mixtures over time. Therefore, human data is limited in that it can only show associations and not cause and effect. So for this reason, we really rely heavily on data that we can generate from non-human primates and laboratory animals um, to bear weight on the evidence of effects we see in human and wildlife populations. So taking all this into account, the following is a non-exhaustive list of reproductive health endpoints that have been linked to exposures to specific chemicals or chemical classes. And I won't go through this in depth um, or in the, interest, in the interest of time, but you can refer to those uh, more specifically and ask questions uh, if need be. Next slide. So as I stated earlier, adequate circulating levels of maternal thyroid hormone are essential for proper neurological development in the fetus. It is well documented that, poly, uh, that B, PCBs sorry, are capable of reducing circulating level of thyroid hormone. So this is a, a very important when we consider the other developmental endpoints that can be impaired by exposure to EDCs, such as neurodevelopment. And other cognitive deficits that have been um, 
that have been associated with EDCs include um, attention deficit disorders and also altered organization of sexually dimorphic regions in the brain that can have, that can be uh, associated with effects directly postnatally as well as into adulthood. So EDCs have also been implicated with metabolic dysregulation and some of these endpoints include obesity and type 2 diabetes. And you can see in parentheses the different chemical and chemical classes that have been associated with, um, with these particular endpoints. And also impaired immune function. So this is uh, an area that's starting to gain a lot more interest. And um, more, most recently, we've had um, a lot of information coming out about the effects of triclosan, which is an antimicrobial agent in many personal care products, and its relationship to the risk of developing allergies, for example. Um, endometriosis, which is uh, a condition that affects many, many women, um, has been directly correlated with phthalate exposure and also possibly polycarbonate and dioxins. Um, and, uh, sorry, polychlorinated biphenols and dioxins. And also, um, PCBs have also been associated with autoimmune thyroid disease. And phthalates have been associated with asthma. Uh, and BPA has been implicated with inflammation overall as well. Next slide. So in relation to the incidence of hormone-related cancers, the, the research is a bit more complicated, and as I stated earlier, this is due in large part to the difficulty in really weeding out um, human exposure risks over time to specific chemicals. Um, but what we have found due to um, primarily laboratory studies in non-human primates and rodents is a direct link between the development of breast cancer uh, or mammary cancer uh, and diethylsilvestrol as well as BPA. As I mentioned earlier, in, in, in the human population of DES exposed women, they experience a 2.5 fold greater risk of developing breast cancer compared to age matched women, age matched women not exposed fetally to DES. And in terms of BPA, while the verdict is still out in terms of the, of the, the direct human risk, um, work in our laboratory has shown that very, very low dose exposure to bisphenol A during the fetal development period uh, actually led to the development of malignant tumors, cancerous tumors, in early adulthood in our rodent models. And that was the first time that that BPA had been shown to be really almost what's considered a complete carcinogen, meaning that in and of itself it can lead to the development of a malignant tumor. Although there have been several studies and with different groups um, that showed uh, a, a, a relationship between uh, BPA and the development of precancerous lesions. So with in relation to other cancers, such as endometrial, prostate, and testicular cancers, there is um, more of, a, uh, of an association uh, with, uh, with endocrine disruptors um, in, in, instead of specific direct links, but they are there. So this just comes this just brings to light what really the major challenges are regarding the determination of carcinogenic potential of endocrine disruptors in that human epidemiological studies cannot easily examine the effects of single chemicals and valid animal models are not currently available for the investigation of most endocrine mediated cancers in humans. So this becomes um, really, really difficult in terms of maintaining a consistency in um, the laboratory 
in, in terms of the data being generated by different academic groups and, indus and industry driven groups and government agencies in, in determining um, the risk factors of specific chemicals for the development of cancer. Next slide. So just to um, continue the conversation on the major challenges regarding the identification and determination of adverse health effects for endocrine disruptors, um, I alluded to this previously, but the, there are in inherent limitations of the current testing methods for the identification of, of these EDCs. And this process is further complicated by the ideological conflict between many toxicologists and endocrinologists regarding possible low-dose effects and non-monotonic responses of these endocrine-disrupting chemicals. Also, there is at this time an incomplete assessment of all windows of susceptibility and routes of exposure for known and possible endocrine-disrupting chemicals. Also, very little data is available on the health impacts of chemical mixtures, which at this point in time is a much more, perhaps much more relevant avenue of um, investigation because we are all exposed to chemical mixtures, not single chemicals. Um, also, there's a need for a widely accepted system to evaluate the strength of evidence of exposures to possible chemicals and their adverse health effects. And at this time, there is a lack of consistent international regulatory standards for the manufacture and regulation of chemicals that leads to the exponential increase in the global burden of chemicals. So I will leave um, more of that discussion to our, our next speaker. Um, and then just to end, I wanted to, uh, next slide, just provide uh, just a few resources that I have found very valuable. So um, primarily the, the, the data that I'm showing in terms of the state of the science was generated or was, was, was um, generated from the review um, by the World Health Organization and the United Nations Environment Program listed here. And uh, also a, a very valuable website um, is the Endocrine Disruptor Exchange or TEDx website um, that is actually was moderated, is moderated by Dr. Theo Colburn. And it's an excellent resource for up-to-date information on the state of endocrine disruptor research. And also, if anyone wants to keep up with what uh, our federal government is doing in terms of, uh, of maintaining the EDSP program, you can find up-to-date information on the uh, EPA, uh, on the Endocrine Disruptor Screening Program through the US EPA website. So with that, I will um, turn the mic over to Kathleen Curtis. Thank you, Nicole. This is Diana, and um, thank you so much. Remember, everyone, there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions of our speakers towards the end of the call, so jot down your, your thoughts now so you'll remember them later. Um, now I'd like to introduce Kathy Curtis, a leading advocate for protecting environmental health through precautionary policy solutions. Kathleen Curtis is Executive Director of Clean and Healthy New York, which promotes safer chemicals, a sustainable economy, and a healthier world. She has over 25 years of experience in the environmental health movement and is a widely recognized national leader. She is Clean and Healthy New York's chief lobbyist and organizer, responsible for the organization's relationship with allies and policymakers. Her leadership has guided enactment of several state laws regulating toxic chemicals. She coordinates the Just Green Partnership, the Alliance for Toxic Free Fire Safety, and the Coming Clean Collaborative's Policy Work Group a forum on local, state, national, international, and market policy that protects people from toxic chemicals. She is also on the steering committees of the Safer Chemicals Healthy Families Coalition and Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. Welcome, Kathy. Kathy thank you for joining us today. And you, you may go ahead and begin. Thank you, Diana. So slide one um, is just sort of the topic of my talk today. Uh, precautionary policy solutions, why they matter, and where they are, both geographically, but also in their evolution. And many of these do address endocrine disruption or endocrine disrupting chemicals. And of course, they matter because the current paradigm, based on risk rather than precaution, is working very well for the producers of endocrine disrupting chemicals, but not so much for the rest of us. Next slide. Um, just, you know, a very baseline introduction to precautionary policy. 
which uh, asks instead of how much harm is po allowable, how a little harm is possible. It's based on the premise that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And uh, these four considerations, although you don't hear the words precautionary principle as often as you once did, are increasingly showing up in proposed policy. Action to prevent harm despite uncertainty when there's just credible evidence of harm. Uh, shifting the burden of proof to proponents of a potentially harmful activity, in other words, prove it safe rather than us having to prove it's harmful. Examination of a full range of alternatives to potentially harmful activities, including do we really need it? Do we really need children's sneakers that light up when they walk if there's mercury or metals involved? And democratic inclusive decision making to ensure that people who are the most effective, affected actually have a seat at the table and are able to uh, bring their expertise to bear on decision making. Next slide. I just thought I'd touch base on a couple of international precautionary policies. There's a, many of these. These few seem to be the most relevant and have the largest campaigns behind them. Um, generally, the US does not sign or participate in these agreements. And in fact, our State Department works to undermine their implementation. They sort of carry the chemical industry's water uh, or ag industry, oil, uh, atomic industry, et cetera. So um, the Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety supports the use of precautionary principle in relation to genetically modified organisms. Obviously, the U.S. is not participating in that uh, protocol. The Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants uses the precautionary model for starting out with a dozen chemicals and adding chemicals for a global ban. There's about 170 countries that participate in the Stockholm Convention around the world. The United States is not one of them. Um, the first one was the one that the U.S. does participate in is the Rio Declaration on Environment and Development. And uh, that states, in order to protect the environment, the precautionary approach shall be widely applied by states according to their capabilities. So it's interesting that, um, you know, that we did apply, we're drag kicking and screaming into one reluctantly uh, signed that, but don't really follow it very well in the US. So um, the third one is what we're seeing now, a sort of non-precautionary uh, policies that such as the Trans-Pacific Partnership and the Transatlantic Free Ta Trade Association that are really designed uh, not for environmental protection or precautionary view, but ra you know sustainability, but rather to free uh, the economy to be able to do whatever it wants. So the opposite of precaution. Next slide. And I just wanted to do a little comparison between the EU and the US just to be illustrative of uh, the, you know, any inequities in how the precautionary principle is being implemented. In the EU, every member state adopts, accepts precaution as a general principle. It's just an accepted general principle that from which they operate. And uh, just some examples of how they walk the walk, as well as just give, providing lip service to it. The Danish EPA held a national conference to examine implementation. And similarly, the British, Scottish, and Swedish governments are doing, doing so as well. And uh, Hungary and Br Brazil have adopted precaution as a guiding principle. I know Brazil isn't part of the EU. I just wanted to see if you guys were still paying attention. But they do have a national precautionary policy. So that's the EU. Next slide. In the US, they, we tend to avoid the words precautionary principle. There's an overall preference for cleaning up messes rather than preventing them. It's a stack of bodies approach, and only, only when a problem has become urgent and the stack of bodies gets to a certain height, does it actually get attention and uh, start to be addressed? And that's because the political system is influenced by corporate interests that oppose the use of precaution. And they've managed to somehow paint it as a wimpy, nanny state, hand wringing, you know, nervous Nelly policy and risk as somehow this Wild Westish, adventuresome approach, manful, man, manly approach somehow. Uh, but that, does, that is not to say that um, there aren't numerous 
precautionary policies in national uh, in national regulatory frame. They just don't use the word precautionary. And certainly the FDA's requirement of new drugs to be tested before their use, which is that basic platform of prove it safe rather than us having to later prove it harmful is an excellent example. Um, there's a commission on ocean policy that recommended the adoption of a precautionary approach to manage the ocean environment. EPA has the ability under the um, Toxic Substances to Control Act to stop marketing of a chemical and require testing if exposures are predicted to be significant. And really what I, the, the EPA, there's an endocrine disruptor screening and testing advisory committee, and it, there have been many calls to strengthen the endocrine disruptor screening program at EPA. Um, the shining light, I think in a way, is the EPA's design for the environment program. Uh, this is a voluntary program that takes on specific chemicals in specific applications, such as BPA in receipt paper or hexabromocyclododecane, a brominated flame retardant, in building insulation. And then they will assess the hazard of the chemical, not the risk, the hazard. It's, it's inherent uh, hazards based on a number of uh, endpoints and um, also assess alternatives. And this is done voluntarily by the businesses that use the chemical, that make the chemical, by NGOs, other impacted communities, for example, firefighters, if it's a flame retardant, and government officials from a number of different agencies. And they use hazard and alternatives assessment rather than risk assessment. Uh, therefore, of course, it's yeah, you know, and actually, they also have re recently reviewed their methodology, which now includes evaluation of estrogenic effects. It stops short of giving it equal weight as other endpoints, such as cancer and aquatic ecotoxicity, but it has opened the door to looking at estrogenic effects. And not surprisingly, it's therefore under attack by the House in particular, and will no doubt be in the next Congress as well. The American Chemistry Council is pushing for a risk-based approach across the board even for this voluntary program, which is really a shining light of precautionary uh, policy. Next slide. Um, so here's an example. It's just what implementation looks like, is when the Danish government banned phthalates and toys designated for children under three without a quantitative risk assessment, simply basing it the decision on these four considerations. Exposure was occurring, they're toxic to lab animals, Children are uniquely susceptible, and, and the ready availability of alternatives. The question was asked, do we need those chemicals? If they're dangerous and they're unnecessary, then that was the precautionary approach that was taken. Now, not surprisingly, the biggest opposition, again, is the American Chemistry Council, which is, and their global you know, um, uh, analogs. And they've created a whole website about the precautionary principle. In fact, if you Google search just precautionary principle, the top hit will be the American Chemistry Council because, of course, they've paid for that designation to be the top of, on the Google search. And they have a section just about phthalates. It'd be worth looking at. Next slide. Uh, here are a couple of state precautionary policies, of which there are many. Uh, New Jersey adopted the School Integrated Pest Management Act that requires all schools to adopt IPM and notification of parents when pesticides are being used. Parents can opt into that and they will get a notice whenever pesticides are being used so that they can apply precaution if they see fit. Uh, the New York has a law requiring schools to use it's the Green Cleaning in Schools initiative to, uh, again, avoid impact on children's health in the environment and not to mention the workers who use them day in and day out for their entire careers. And teachers who are, you know, pregnant, most, most teachers are still women. And so if they're pregnant, it's bring your kid to work day every day for teachers. So it's important to make the school environment safer for all those reasons. And uh, one of my, again, shining light, and this bill will probably never pass, but it's a New York bill called the Public Health Protection Act that specifically uh, states that it's establishing a precautionary policy for state and local governments in New York State. So similar to that EU model where uh, member states have adopted the precautionary principle as their uh, screen through which they put policies, New York uh, has made an effort to do the same. This bill continually gets stuck in ways and means, which is the, we're too 
cheap to implement it, even if it would, you know, even uh, we could have saved the environment and people, but we were too doggone cheap, basically, is the sticking point on that policy actually advancing. And then, um, next slide, please. Uh, there, there's a lot that can be done on a local level, and I could have gone on and on and on and all about all of the municipalities that have adopted precautionary policies um, and how they often start out there and then end up being the laboratory for state uh, advancements and eventually federal reform. But I just picked the first one, the first in the nation um, is the city of San Francisco that contains these five elements that are very similar to the ones that we talked about already. Anticipatory action, get ahead of the curve, get avoid the harm rather than trying to fix it later, right to know, alternatives assessment, full cost accounting, not just the cost to industry or not just the cost when you're buying a specific product, but across the whole life cycle, the cost to the community it's being disposed in, the cost to the workers that are being uh, exposed you know, during production or mining or, you know, the whole life cycle analysis and the participatory de decision process. City of Seattle also has um, a precautionary policy that was arrived at through a working group process that uh, was very broad and diverse and uh, inclusionary. Inclusive. Uh, next slide. And so now, uh, due to the, you know, sort of momentum that we have, uh, from these various uh, enacted policies and implemented policies, uh, we're, you know, the 21st century, the way it's the 21st century precautionary policy looks is more comprehensive, less of a chemical by chemical approach on a state level and more uh, of a, an infrastructure approach to chemicals so that we can get off this toxic treadmill and not just switch from one hazardous chemical to another about which is little is known and that are not, is not regulated. So these comprehensive laws have been enacted in several states. They create a precautionary framework for disclosing and regulating chemicals in consumer products. They include you know, some of our uh, top 10 uh, all-time hits, like right to know, alternative assessments, and hazard-based classification of chemicals, not risk-based, just on the, are, they, are they on the list of uh, hazardous chemicals. And there's uh, there's uh, a number of them that are pending in other states, such as New York and Oregon, uh, I, I'd say are the two that are closest to passage, but a number of other states also introduce these precautionary bills. Next slide. Um, flame retardants are you know, major endocrine disrupted, disrupting chemicals, and there is some precautionary policy uh, on them as well that has been enacted in some states, but this is uh, the model for 2015 right here is uh, eliminating the use of 10 flame retardant chemicals in upholstered furniture and children's products. Um, it doesn't require proof of exposure. It doesn't require permissible levels or any other risk factor. It's simply these chemicals cannot be used in that product sector. It also allows for assessment of replacement chemicals prior to their use as replacement chemicals and further bans if those chemicals are found hazardous. So the list of 10 chemicals just quickly is TDCPP, TCEP, which are both chlorinated tris chemicals, TBBPA, decabromodiphenyl ether, which is replacing the decabromodiphenyl ethane. See, that's what they do. They just, they just tweak the molecule a little bit, and it's not banned, and they're back, back in business. Antimony trioxide, hexabromocyclododecane, uh, TB, TBPH, TBB, tetrabromobenzoate, chlorinated paraffins, and TCPP, the third and most widely used TRIS chemical that's actually a high production volume chemical. And then it says such other chemical flame retardants as the commission may specify by rule. And so that enables states and the federal government, this is also a federal, federal bill introduced by Senator Chuck Schumer, uh, can add to that list as time goes by by going, you know, assessing the hazards of the replacement chemicals. Next slide. So here are some resources um, for folks. And uh, this was really a fascinating topic to me that never 
uh, never stops to, you know, in holding my interest in making you want to go de deeper and deeper and peel off, peel off the layers of the onion. So I really appreciate um, the opportunity to talk with you folks about one of my favorite subjects today. And uh, thank you for listening. Next slide, which is just a thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, that was an excellent presentation. I know you didn't have a lot of time, but you covered a lot of ground. So mm -hmm. again, everyone, hold, hold your questions. Um, because now I'd like to invite Pam Miller, Executive Director of Alaska Community Action on Toxics, to talk about ACAT's work on policy solutions as we head into the next session of the Alaska State Legislature. So Pam, welcome. Thank you, Diana, and great presentations, uh, Nicole and Kathy. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, and Kathy mentioned uh, a policy that um, groups in other states are advocating, and we in Alaska are also advocating for an important measure and precautionary measure that we think is very critical pr to protect the health of children and other vulnerable people, such as firefighters, because we also know that you know, children are especially vulnerable and firefighters um, are at risk because these chemicals place an undue burden on um, firefighters who put their lives on the line every day. So as, as Kathy mentioned, the model policy that we're, we're trying to work for to achieve here in Alaska phases out the use of some of the most hazardous flame retardants from children's products in office and residential furniture. And Kathy mentioned them, so I won't go through the list again. These are identified by governments as highly toxic and the policy also out outlines specific chemicals and uses and has farther reaching safety implications because it helps prevent manufacturers from substituting chemicals that are designated of high concern. These are chemicals that cause diseases such as cancer. They have neurodevelopmental effects. They're persistent, bioaccumulative, and toxic. And this really achieves another important goal, which is moving the market towards safer products. And it avoids what the chemical manufacturers like to do, and that is um, preventing, uh, well, they like to <laughs> substitute more toxic substances for others. So we want to avoid that, what we like to call regrettable substitution. So we think that this is really critical, especially in Alaska, because we are on the receiving end, because of our position in the north, for chemicals that rise on wind and ocean currents and come to us from all parts of the world, including lower latitudes in the U.S., but also many other countries from throughout the world. They accumulate in the bodies of animals and wildlife living in the north. These are building up in the north and in the Arctic and entering the food web. And so, for example, we know that women from the yukon Kuskokwim Delta of Alaska have some of the highest levels of some of these flame retardants, the PBDEs, in their bodies compared with any population in the circumpolar Arctic. And also in Alaska, we may be at risk for higher exposures because our homes are insulated against the cold and we spend more time indoors. So again, we're more potentially um, exposed to higher levels of harmful chemicals, including flame retardants, but, but also bisphenol A and other chemicals that accumulate in our indoor environment. So again, this is a very critical measure to protect children and others, such as firefighters who are particularly vulnerable. Our legislative session begins in mid-January. This, The bill that we're looking to pass has not yet been introduced, so we need sponsors and, and clearly bipartisan support for this measure. So we're currently talking to different legislators to seek their support this should be uh, a measure that whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, you should agree that, that it's very important to protect children's health and to protect the health of firefighters. So just in closing, I think we need everyone's support in sending a message to our legislators that this is an important issue to protect children's health. And this really affects children's ability to learn and grow and to protect firefighters, as I mentioned, again, who put themselves in harm's way every day. Um, if you'd like more information, I'll, I'll cut it a little bit short there. Please contact us, and Mari Carmen and Chris in our office are really taking the lead on this. 
We're happy to talk with you about ways that you can become involved. This is a real priority for ACAT, and we have support from important organizations such as the Alaska Nurses Association, firefighters, and the Alaska Federation of Natives. And then lastly, I just want to mention one other resource in addition to the great ones that Kathy and Nicole mentioned, and that is, that is yesterday the International Pops Elimination Network, IPEN, in conjunction with the Endocrine Society, released a report on endocrine disrupting chemicals as a guide for public interest organizations and also policymakers. And we'll make this available on our website and um, a resource that we send out to everyone after this call. So thank, thanks again very much. Thank you, Pam. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you to all of our participants for calling in. This is the portion of the call when we invite your participation and questions. If you would like to ask a question of any of our speakers, please press star 2 to unmute your line. Please also state your name and affiliation if you're affiliated with a, with a group or agency. And we ask that you try to be brief so others have the opportunity to participate. Again, you press star 2 to unmute your line. Hi, this is Patty. Um, my question, I don't know which of the speakers to address it to, but it seemed like the focus was going to be um, exposure to BPA. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, we did talk about some other um, chemicals as well, but I'm wondering what the deal is with BPA. Is it because we're all exposed to it, because it's particularly toxic? at extremely low levels, or why do we need to focus on BPA? Um, this is Nicole. I think I can go ahead and take this question. Um, thank you for it, because it's, <laughs> it, it is an important question. BPA has really become, I think, in a lot of ways, a poster child for possible endocrine disruptors. Um, and primarily, it's important because it is, everywhere. I mean, we are exposed. It is one of the highest volume chemicals produced. So it really is just being pumped out everywhere. And it's in so many uh, it's in so many products that a lot of people don't even know about. I mean, it's not just the plastics. It's the resins that line your cans. It's in dental sealants. It's in the thermal receipt paper that you handle every day. I mean, our, our exposure risk is, is extremely high, which is why it has been so heavily studied and invested in. Um, and the other really important thing about it, which is something I, I tried to, um, a point I, I hope I, I got across in my talk was, you know, there is a lot of controversy related to how dangerous a lot of these chemicals are. And toxicologists, for the most part, tend to address the health risks um, in relation to the dose. So the dose makes the poison concept. So higher the dose, the, the greater the, the, the effect. And so if you, just, if you just extrapolate down far enough, you're going to reach a safe dose and we're all going to be fine. Um, but that's really a lesson that we've learned. Um, you know, I've, I've seen in the studies I've, I've done on BPA and low dose that, and others have seen as well with other chemicals, that these chemicals that work on the endocrine system work in the same, in, work in the same way that horm natural hormones. They bind at low, very, you need a very small amount to exert large biological effects. And sometimes you lose the effect when you're doing studies if you, if you use too high a dose. So it's, um, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's really, I think, why BPA has really been so heavily invested in is if, if, the, the goal is if we can show with no doubt that BPA will cause all of these health effects, then maybe they'll remove it from the market and maybe we'll, this will create a snowball effect with other chemicals. But, you know, as, as Kathy Curtis mentioned, there is extreme resistance, at least on a national level, for um, really determining that any chemical, even when it's heavily studied as BPA, is actually dangerous in any way because I think it would have serious ramifications on our financial and political system. Which is why the precautionary approach is so important. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for your question, Patty. 
Um, are there other questions out there, other people who would like to ask a question of our speakers? We have a few minutes left and before I wrap up. Don't be shy. Patty again. Um, one of the important things about the precautionary principle that you said was, um, all of you said, was the availability of other alternatives or do we really need this? And so what are the alternatives to BPA, the safe alternatives? Because I know there's some regrettable ones. What are the safe ones? <laughs> uh, this is Kathy. I, I, I just saw... Um, Something, I get a ton of stuff in my inbox, and I just saw an innovative company that is sort of all over Wisconsin. Wisconsin, a bunch of uh, grocery chains and uh, store chains are using this alternative to BPA and receipt paper, and it's vitamin C based. So, I mean, it's preliminary. It's not like it's readily available, uh, and maybe not even, I don't even know about its cost and performance effectiveness, but it's... Uh, you know, a lot of folks are using it in Wisconsin. So uh, it's the kind of thing, it's the better bat mousetrap um, principle where we're not wanting to go back and live in caves and bang rocks together. It's more a question of American ingenuity. And if you build a better mousetrap, there'll be the path to your door. And so people are always coming out with uh, alternatives, alternative flame retardants, alternative uh, um, B for BPA and for phthalates. And uh, you're right, some of them are just as bad, if not worse, but some of them have show real promise. And another way to, you know, think about alternatives is to think about alternative-based materials that don't even require the drop-in chemical to begin with. That's especially true for flame retardants. Just designing your product differently so it doesn't require the chemical. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was a good Good question, Patty. And I get this is Diana. Another alternative is just to choose different material, you know, just to purchase fewer plastics where you can avoid plastics. Right. And again, with BPA, it's difficult because it's in everything. It's in your receipts. But some stores say BPA-free um, thermal receipt paper right on the receipt. So we can talk to our local grocers and request that. And it helps to, to educate people about the risks as well. But thank you very much. Um, if you have additional questions or comments, please feel free to contact us. Our phone number is 907-222-7714, or you can send an email to diana at akaxon.org. Thanks again. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful holiday season, and we look forward to having you all on the line again next year.